we're at one of those moments where there's a shift occurring. We should all kind of look around us and pay attention. The WTO is stuck. And a lot of people are saying the WTO is dead, it's not going anywhere. That's hyperbole. The WTO is, was a major accomplishment. It, as I'll show you in a second, it created a real institutional function. And so it's not going anywhere. It's going to be there for a long, long time, doing what it does best, which is providing a forum to decide its own rules. It may well be stuck, perhaps permanently, with respect to negotiations, which are now shattering into lots of littler pieces, and the pieces are starting to coagulate. Uh, they're starting to pull together in bigger clusters. And so at this moment, there's a Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement on the table, and it's being negotiated by nine countries. Um, many people think that the TPPA is really a reflection on the European Union. That is to say, the European Union is a free trade zone. It, it has, up until recently at least, been very successful in competing with the United States as a trade bloc. Now the United States wants to reestablish its old advantage by creating its own, its own trade zone uh, that it can be a leader in, if not the leader, and that's the TPPA, the Trans-Pacific Region. And so there are two advantages to doing that. One is, by the time the TPPA done, it will be bigger than the European Union. So that's why the rules of the TPPA matter. And you get the point. We're, we're, we're at a crucial moment where big shifts are happening. And the TPPA is, is uh, it's a paradigm. It's, it's a big deal. It's like one of those shifts. And in some ways, it's like power shifting away from the WTO, but the WTO is not leaving. So maybe it, you could think of it as accretion, the way snow piles on a glacier. It's the old snow. Just to summarize the point I made earlier, the TPPA is very important because it represents a shift away from the WTO as a negotiating forum, because it could be actually bigger than the European Union, <clears throat> and because the EU is not part of the negotiations. Um, most of this assessment is focused on the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, and as you probably know, about four of the chapters have been leaked, so we, we see drafts, but those are drafts that are months, if not a year or older. Um, the other chapters have not been released yet, so I'm referring to the models from which the negotiators are working. For example, the most recent free trade agreements in the United States or Australia or New Zealand. You've got the TPPA, which is a framework of trade rules covering 20 some odd chapters. This is what we were looking at earlier. Yeah. Um, I have on the screen the cover page of the intellectual property rights chapter. And apparently this is standard language on all the chapters. Document is classified. as of a certain date, and it's to be declassified four years from entry into force. Why four years? Is that the standard election cycle? Mm -hmm. The rules that tend to affect state and local governments the most include those that affect regulation of goods, regulation of services, procurement, subsidies, and investment. Investment meaning ownership of land, ownership of, fa of a factory, ownership of a company. So the WTO family of agreements covers all of these categories, goods, services, procurement, subsidies, but not investment. Free trade agreements of the United States cover goods, services, and procurement and investment, giving foreign investors, Americans abroad, foreign companies here, uh, greater rights than their domestic counterparts, but not subsidies. In bilateral investment treaties, none of, this, none of the trade rules apply, but there are investment protection rules and a procedure for investors to, uh, to litigate those rules. So that's the big picture. These are the rules that apply. And what you can see from the chart I just, just displayed is that there's overlap. I'm giving you a list now of uh, different kinds of state regulatory authority uh, that illustrate that what we used to think of as local is now global. And these are all um, areas of regulation that are covered by both trade agreements on services and international investment agreements. It's an A to Z list. I won't read it all. You can see it, starting with alcohol and broadband and electricity, ending up with tobacco, water, and zoning. And it's just a representative list that you can probably know from your personal experience, things that I've left out. So. Uh, here are a few categories that have been the subject of foreign investment disputes. 
hazardous waste, gasoline additive. There have been several cases involving gasoline additives. Mining reclamation, the tobacco settlement, which was actually the uh, uh, a movement of tobacco litigation that was settled on behalf of 46 states by state attorneys general. Water resources. So a lot of these are things that are actually provided by or regulated by state and local governments, and yet they are now international in the sense that the companies who are providing an effective good or service are international companies. They're either a foreign firm crossing a border to provide a service, for example, the Canadian tribal corporations that were selling cigarettes in the United States, or it might be a French-owned conglomerate that has an American subsidiary that provides municipal water services. That makes it international for purposes of both the services agreement and for purposes of an international investment agreement. Even though the service is completely contained by your county, it's international because of who owns the company. And the theme of who gets to use bargaining power. The pharmaceutical companies want to define market power as their power to shape the market to sell a patented drug that they've created or expanded um, with their marketing with their marketing power to achieve market power, to set the price. Government wants to use the, the power of purchasing in great volumes. And as you've seen the states do, there are a number of actual regional pooling arrangements between state Medicaid programs that the states are trying to make themselves bigger purchases than they could do on their own as an individual state. So there's real power on both sides, and this trade agreement takes sides. Yes to pharma power, no to government power. Do you agree with the European Union that procurement is covered by the WTO agreement on goods? Why is that an important question? It's an important question because most states worked under the assumption that if they did not list an agency as covered under the procurement agreement, or that if they did not agree to participate at all, they were creating a safe harbor if they wanted to discriminate in favor of domestic suppliers like Ontario has, or if they wanted to use environmental preferences, or if they wanted to use human rights standards in the way that they did their procurement. What this case means is that that might all be for naught, particularly if you are interested in a state or local government in covering um, in using preferences to stimulate your local economy, to do procurement and job creation. And especially interesting is the fact that while states have been deciding whether they want to be in these agreements or not, consistently throughout all of these procurement agreements, the United States has never listed city or county governments. Some countries have. If procurement preferences are indeed covered by the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, all governments at all levels are covered. So this interpretation by the European Union is pretty fundamental. It raises basic questions about what procurement is and who's covered by it. And it could completely upset all the expectations by state and local officials as to whether their procurement preferences are covered by trade rules or not. Does that make sense? In this new global economic constitution, the WTO family of agreements, and you could add to that all these other agreements, the 2,600 bilateral investment treaties, which are constitutional. 2,600. And they're all connected by treaty shopping provisions, which we can talk about later. And then the US free trade agreements and the European free trade agreements, and now Brazil and China are out there negotiating free trade agreements. So everybody's adopting all these constitutions. And it's layered on top of your existing one. That makes the law very complicated, and it makes the law of a legislator at the national or state level um, kind of hard to fathom. It's, it's turned what used to be a fairly predictable, logical system into legal chaos. So I hope that's responsive to your question, why, why it matters that we're layering and layering all this new international law on top of our existing law. And again, I have to stress, this is not about tariffs and regulating trade anymore only. Now it's also about layer of layer of layer of limits on government power, some of which layers are 
inconsistent with each other, and most of which are different from, if not actually contradictory to, what we think of as U.S. constitutional law.